So sparsity, right? What does sparsity mean? Um, a weight vector w is sparse if it is mostly zero. That's sort of the, the sort of the, the non-formal sort of intuition of what sparsity means. People formalize it in different ways. Sparsity is you know, measured mathematically by the L0 norm, which counts the number of non-zero entries. So why don't we optimize for the L0 norm if we want a sparse model? Anyone know? I'm sorry? It is not a norm. There's another reason why we don't do it, though. It is not continuous, yes. That's right. S same reason why we don't optimize for zero one loss directly. But L1 induces sparsity. It's, uh, if you look at the optimization uh, literature, L1 is known as the, the, the norm that is the sort of the envelope norm, the convex envelope of the L0 norm. So the one that is um, the tightest possible that still induces sparsity. <laughs> that's, still a, that's still a norm. So people tend to, when people care about sparsity, people tend to um, regularize using the L1 norm. Why is sparsity important? Um, there are some practical reasons. For example, uh, computational memory efficiency. Right? So if I have like, a feature vector with a million dimensions, and I know that I can, and I have some, I have some assumption that maybe, you know, um, just a few of those, if I just train a model that's sparse with only a few non-zero entries, um, I can predict pretty well, right? Suppose I knew that. And that often is true in many cases, right? Like if you're doing text classification where this is all the words in your vocabulary, and for various certain classification tasks, you know that many of the words are just not predictive at all of the text, cl text classification task, then this sparsity assumption is actually very useful. What does that mean? That means I can store my model very compactly. I don't have to store a million numbers, which may be a thousand or maybe a hundred. Um, it's also more efficient to do a dot product, right? I just go over a linked list of a few entries rather than have to loop through a million uh, elements, most of which give you give me a zero in the dot product. So there are computational memory reasons to want to do um, want sparsity in your model classes if you have reason to believe that a sparse <coughs> model can still predict pretty accurately. Sometimes the true model is sparse. Right? And we want to actually recover the non-zero dimensions of W. This is something that people care about, especially in statistics, high-dimensional statistics. Right? And so just a one-slide sort of teaser on the type of theory that people um, study in, in terms of lasso. Um, suppose that the true data was generated according to this model with respect to with some W star that's unknown to us and some Gaussian corrupted noise. So the y is this plus some Gaussian corrupted noise. And we want to s estimate w stars as well as possible using this function where the data points are generated like this. Then if we set lambda to be at least, as to be at least this quantity that's controlled by um, the variance of the noise, the size of the dimensionality of the input space, how many train examples we have, and a couple other factors, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the main thing is that uh, this number decreases as n goes, as n increases. As, as we have more training data, we can set lambda smaller. Then with high probability, and this probability increases with, with the number of training examples, the, not the support of W, which is the, 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 the set of, which is the set of uh, non-zero parameters, so which parameters are non-zero, is a, is a subset of the parameters of the support of the W star. So high precision. Anything that we think is non-zero is actually non-zero. Right? And if the norms are big enough, and if the weight of the norms are big enough, right, if all the weights we estimate have some margin away from zero within this estimation problem, then we can prove with high probability that we actually exactly recover the support. So sometimes high recall. Yes? Could you uh, do, after using L1 regularization and having all the dimensions that are the most important in some way, can you use L2 without the zero dimensions to loop? Yeah, people often do that. People often use L1 to identify a set of dimensions that are most important, and then use some other estimation learning problem afterwards on only those features. It's a very common thing to do. Yes? Sorry, <coughs> Support. So, 
so it's the specific here just refers to the set of indexes. So you have D prep, D, D features. It's the set of features. So the so it's the so for example, if the first if, if only feature one was non-zero in W, then the support of W is just index one. So it's a set one. Just it indexes over the feature dimensions. So it's the set of non-zero. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not actually looking at the magnitude of the feet of the W. Just which ones are non-zero. So it says give me all the ones that are non-zero. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's w star? I'm sorry. W star. W star. So this is a sort of a uh, a very uh, sort of stylized example where I assume that there is, does exist some W star that generated this data corrupted by Gaussian noise. What is kappa? It's a great question, and I actually forget. <laughs> um, the, the main point of this was to show the dependency on n, capital N, because everything else remains constant. For any problem set, typically the way think, people think about this is everything remains constant with respect to, except for n, because you could collect more data. So oftentimes when I look at these results, I tend to ignore everything but the n, at least at first pass, so I actually forget what kappa is. If you are interested, it, you know, I have some references here. <coughs> Yes. I didn't understand So suppose that the data was actually generated according to this process. We just don't know what W star is, but we assume that it exists. But the model of data is like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The non-zero features recovered from Lasso had a lot of overlap with the principal components of the data set. No, not exactly. <coughs> you explain why? Uh, principal components are not axis aligned, but this, this statement is always axis aligned. Like, what are the axis aligned dimensions that are non zero in my model? Principal components are not axis aligned, so it's not exact. They're, they're, they're actually two fairly different concepts. Yeah? So this says that if you find like a non zero. That's right. But if you find a zero component, there's no guarantee that it's like Right, so it's a high precision statement, not a high recall statement. Right. Okay, so this is a little, it's a little hard to compare the two because the, the actual scales of L1, L2 is sort of not as important as the rate at which it grows, and so this makes it a little bit harder to compare one L2 directly in a graph. But I guess the, my, my main point for showing this is um, this graph is, uh, let, me, let me explain how this, uh, how this graph is plotted. Um, as I change the regularization strength lambda, each, each point, the x-axis the, the is the magnitude of the learned model for the first dimension, and the y-axis is the magnitude of the learned model for the second dimension, okay? And how I drew these curves is I just tried different values of lambda, and I plotted what the model is, and then I drew this curve, right? And so the main thing that I wanted to emphasize, and maybe I should have found a somewhat better example, is that here you see that in L1 regularization, the, uh, the weight vector for male it becomes sparse right here, right? It becomes zero. Whereas the weight, whereas the weight parameter for male in, under L2 penalty never actually becomes zero, right? So over here, lambdas are really large, and over here, lambda is basically zero. <coughs> this is a demonstration of sort of what is in, in, induced by L2 penalty versus L1. So once it becomes zero, you can just not even keep it in memory anymore. Don't even need to store it. Okay, so just a recap. Um, today we talked about lasso versus ridge regression. There's, you know, when you when you choose different regularization penalties, you have you're implicitly making some sort of modeling assumptions about what is a good model class to train over this data set. Right? Lasso learns a sparse weight vector. Ridge regression does not. Right. In terms of predictive accuracy, oftentimes lasso. Is not uh, doesn't give you a very accurate model, and so people usually rerun least squares on the dimensions selected by Lasso as a second step in practice, because Lasso doesn't make many guarantees on the square loss. Right, the, the guarantee of Lasso was in recovering the support of the true model. 
if there is a true model that's sparse. Lasso, you know, is does offer some benefits in terms of ease of inspection, right? Because if you, you know, a, a, a parameter vector with very few non-zero entries is easier to sort of inspect manually and try to understand what the model is doing than some model class with that's really complicated and lots of non-zero weights and things happening that you don't understand. Right? So oftentimes, many people prefer using Lasso as a step towards sort of understanding the data. And what are the features that are truly predictive of this phenomenon? Uh, at a high level, it seems like Lasso is tricky to optimize, um, and it is, right? It requires subgrading, it's not differentiable and all that stuff. There are advanced optimization techniques that um, actually do optimize Lasso very, very quickly. And if you're interested, uh, there are some references on the website, course website. But you will not be asked to implement L1 regularized regression in this class. You can just use the, the, it requires more advanced optimization techniques that are beyond the scope of this class. Okay, so just to recap regularization in general, we have L2, L1, we have multitask, right? And you know, if you have some sort of, and multitask I should just say, is sort of motivated by some assumption, right? We have this modeling assumption that these tasks are related, and so we should have some level of encouragement that the two uh, models that we learned, the two tasks, should be closer, close to each other, right? And if you have some modeling assumption of your own about some learning problem, you can also insert it as a, encode it as a regularization penalty. Which, in, which, you know, in, unless, which, unless you have data that overwhelmingly tells you otherwise, you prefer the model to look something like this. That's what the regularization term tells you. Okay, so for the next two lectures, we'll be looking at this. Oh, I should, I should, sorry. Got any questions here? Yes? Are there any other principles when you're trying to decide to use lasso? Um, those are the main principles that people think about. Like when people try to think of a lasso versus ridge, what I just discussed is probably the vast majority of considerations that people think about in practice. But is there any situation where you strongly prefer ridge, like versus lasso? Are there any? I, if I don't care about sparsity, I always use ridge. Okay. Like I, I, I personally rarely use lasso for because my research doesn't require sparsity, for the most part. Um, in which case. Lasso does tend to have lower accuracy. Right? Any other questions? Yes. So for the multitask, can we learn more than two models at once? Three, four, and then. Yeah, you can learn. You could just you could add this term for like every you know every pair. So how would you, how how would we uh, like that? The simplest thing to do is all pairs, right? Like if uh, W V and then U, right? Then I would do this for W and V, do this for W and U, do this for V and U. I mean, there are more, there are better ways to do it, but you know, just a naive generalization of this would be that. And there is a, a link in the class website on generalized multitask uh, regularized uh, prediction. Any other questions? Yes. You have more tasks to present three or four tasks, and you have more uh, weight vectors. What should we do? I'm sorry, I didn't think If you have more weight vectors, for example, in multitask, you have three vectors, W, V, and uh, There are a few different ways. Uh, as I said before, the most obvious thing is to have multiple pairs. Right? But that leads to, a, I guess, a quadratic blow up because it's combinatorial. If you have many tasks, there are other things people can do. Um, I have a link to some resources on the course website. Okay, so for the next two lectures, we'll be talking about uh, decision trees, which is a highly nonlinear model class. Okay? And some of their generalizations that are often used in conjunction with decision trees, such as bagging, random forests, and boosting, and ensemble selection. And no recitation this week. <laughs>